Great. Uh, thank you, Tiffany, for moderating. Thanks, Hannes, for taking a look at the at the paper. And thank you to the organizers, Jacques, Julian, Andre, for having me uh, having me here. This is you know uh, this is my this is my second time, in fact. And um, this second talk is you know uh, is also going to be in line with the with the theme of of the first one, which uh, I checked my calendar was around three years ago. Uh, and the broad, you know, uh, the broad issue that we want to try and understand is, you know, what is, uh, you know, the value of data from from a platform's perspective? Uh, and, you know, the, the sort of uh, initial motivating theme is everyone sort of knows and has seen this uh, cover of The Economist uh, in like, I think this is from 2017, where they said that the world's most valuable resource is data, right? And, you know, whenever we've had these conversations around the value of data, the focus has mostly been uh, the value of sort of quote unquote uh, internal data. That is, you know, people come onto your platform, you uh, they leave digital traces, and you are able to leverage those to, you know, maybe provide better recommendations, maybe iterate on your product, and um, and you know, maybe that uh, that makes it better for the platform. And in fact, you know, trying to quantify that uh, the value of that sort of data was uh, was the theme of the paper that I presented three years ago, where you know we looked at the editor versus the algorithm uh, in joint work with Chris Poikert and and York Lawson. Uh, where what we basically did, oops, sorry, yeah, where we basically did what what we basically did was that you know it was a large scale field experiment where we tried to analyze human curation decisions uh, versus algorithmic recommendations, and in particular, the focus of that paper was um, how does the value of uh, you know, internal data matter to make your algorithmic recommendations better, right? So how does the value of uh, personal information matter uh, in a general sense, the traces that they leave online? So in particular, the volume of uh, personal information, the stock versus flow of internal data, the variability in external events, you know, that creates a uh, variability in the amount of data related to news stories. So um, you know, this is sort of a throwback to, uh, to to this seminar series, but also the broad sort of picture that we've generally been looking at, the focus on internal data. Now, this paper uh, is motivated, you know, by, you know, within this broad umbrella, by the observation that, um, that practitioners more and more uh, highlight the need to use external data. For example, you know, over 90% of analytics professionals have said that uh, firms need to increase the use of their external data. Um, you know, uh, many consulting companies ha have put forward the ideas that uh, that firms may gain an edge by incorporating external data as part of their broader data ecosystems. Um, and how you know how does this uh, external data act? You know, how do you actually leverage this external data? Often through uh, these data sharing agreements, right? You, you know, APIs or application programming interfaces, uh, they're bec becoming increasingly common. For example, you know, uh, Google search, uh, uh, Google search, and Google search suggestions as an API for publishers and developers. Um, so, in some sense, that's the that's the focus of this paper. In particular, what we mean by external data is you know, digital representations of acts, facts, or information that's provided by external providers, often through data sharing agreements. And the context of this paper will focus on, you know, one particular dimension or one particular type uh, of data input within a, a search market setting. Now, why, why we think, you know, this is uh, an important area or an, uh, broadly an important question is, despite you know the talk around it, it despite its potential economic relevance it's been challenging to pin down its causal uh, impact now uh, seth benzel john john hirsch and uh, and marshall van Alstein, they have a nice paper which looks at you know what what's the uh, you know what's the benefit to firms 
when they open up their data or you know when they open up their platform through api access not not necessarily only data and they try and quantify that in some sense our our paper is going to be a complementary uh, paper which will look at the other side which is that if i am a smallish sort of company or a newish sort of product what's the benefit that i get if i tap into a larger players uh, you know data uh, data set uh, or a larger players broader data ecosystem now um you know this this topic is not only important from you know let's say uh, a managerial perspective that okay you know platforms can maybe or companies can leverage external data but this also has uh, a policy flip side to it for example you know with the digital services act and the and the digital markets act uh, passed recently in you know uh, in europe um, it sort of classifies companies into gatekeepers uh and you know uh, if companies are of a certain size above a certain threshold they are these larger companies uh, that are termed gate gatekeepers or market leaders and at least uh you know in in the recent drafts or you know the the regulations that that have been proposed uh especially in the context of the search market um imposes certain obligations on these larger gatekeeper companies in particular they say that you know you have to provide uh to any 30 uh, third party providers of online search engines with access to ranking data query data click data uh, view data you know assuming you know it's in, it's in, it's in a de-identified manner um so you know that these regulations are sort of uh are imposing these data sharing agreements right and this is not only a, you know this is not only an eu thing uh, in china uh, recently there was a 20 point agenda around the data economy with the idea that data sharing should enable the growth of small and medium sized companies i haven't seen uh, similar regulations being proposed in the us but uh, you know us in terms of regulation is always half a step behind and in the us i always look at california i feel that california is the europe of the us so i'm sure you know uh, we're going to see uh, something come up uh, in the near future so with this sort of uh, you know uh, this big picture setting the questions that we ask in this paper is what is the causal impact of access to the market leaders data on the focal company's product performance our context will be of the search market um where and in particular we're going to look at search suggestions think of autocomplete um and the market leader in in our context is you know is basically the biggest player or is uh, is the biggest player in the field um and the you know when we're talking about market leaders data we're going to be looking at one particular dimension of the market leaders data as an input into uh, the broader product uh, of uh, that's being developed by the focal company that's the baseline question and then we try and uh, try and see how you know if there is any sort of impact on getting access to the market leaders data how does it vary across types of users and types of content uh you know heavy users versus new users can can leveraging external external data um maybe mitigate the the cold start uh, the cold start problem um how how is this sort of data input uh, into the search so uh, into the search process uh how does it vary in its efficacy in terms of like popular or mainstream content relative to niche content you know we have to keep in mind that um that you know one of the the fundamental benefits of digitization is that you know we can identify people's preferences and cater to even long tail preferences right an interesting dimension of this uh, of our setup will be that um the the queries through our uh, uh through the api will be deidentified so in some sense there won't be that much personal data at play but 
you know, we still want to see whether such, you know, data sharing agreements can actually lead to, uh, you know, benefits in terms of both popular and niche content. Moreover, the, the final sort of um, question that we'll be looking at is the impact in the short term versus the longer term. You know, of course, these are relative terms. Our uh, we'll have a field experiment, and so our field experiment goes on for about sixteen months, I think. Um, and so, you know, we can look at uh, the effect in the first two months relative to how it uh, how it traces out over time. Just to just to give you a sense of where we are headed with uh, you know with these uh, with these results. Our, our experiment will be about removing access to the market leaders' uh, data, so uh, access through an API. So think of this as uh, you know, think of this as external data leveraged through APIs. Um, what we find is that removing access to the market leaders' data leads to uh, a 4.6 percent decline in engagement with the product. Um, you know, it's we. You know, uh, so we can have a conversation about whether we think that this, you know, this magnitude is big or small. I'd love to get your input. Um, then we talk about you know how it varies across types of users and content. What we find is that heavier users are affected more. But despite the de-identified nature of these API calls uh, and how the, the API data is used in the process. We find that both popular and niche content are affected. So this gave us a sense that you know maybe at least this particular type of data sharing, which I'm you know I'm going to go into the details, can actually uh, you know in a de-identified de manner can help both popular and niche content, even though the the API calls were de-identified. Um, finally, what we find is that the average effect is. Uh, uh, is much smaller than the uh, than the decline in performance overall. So uh, initially, the decline in performance of the product is much larger, and then it becomes less negative over time. And we and we have a reason, you know, or at least we posit one, uh, you know, uh, one mechanism which might explain that, which is that uh, potentially when you're leveraging external data, your own internal systems are not being able to develop as much based on internal data so when you remove you know access to that crutch uh you know it helps it helps your systems develop better and in fact like at least anecdotally um you know in conversations with uh, with our partners we do you know one of the reasons it seemed as if they were willing to run this experiment was to see whether their product would stand on its own okay so that's the broad overview, and now I'm going to go into some of the details. Tiffany, uh, we're good on questions. Uh, right now, there uh, we haven't received any question, but I will let you know if there's. Sounds good. Question. Sounds good. Yeah. So you know, with that broad overview, um, let me give you more details of the context. So we partner up with a leading Chinese technology company. It has uh, you know millions of active users. Now it's, uh, you know, the product, it's an app, a, like a super app, as, in the, as is the case in, uh, in many of these uh, Chinese applications, which has a number of functions. There's the newsfeed, there's videos, there's, you know, you can stream eBooks, there's uh, the search engine, file management, et cetera. Our focus is going to be on search suggestions, which was a product that was being uh, that started being developed by the company in 2020. Um, we treat, you know, we part, you know, we partner with the team that was developing uh, this product, which is part of the of the larger company. But it's a, it's a startup like setup, right? It's it's not a, a large number of members. They they have uh, to some extent limited access to computing uh, facilities, etc. Uh, the new product which is the search suggestions or autocomplete is embedded within this super app as i was uh, as i was saying so in particular um you know the 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 context is that of search suggestions or autocomplete so you know keep in mind that 
as you start typing something uh, in any search box, there are these drop down suggestions, right? And the main aim of this team was to try and make you click on those suggestions, basically because it'll bridge the gap between the user's intent and content consumption. Um, companies seem to invest a lot uh, in this. Uh, there's you know more and more evidence coming out that this this has economic relevance in some sense you know uh, we've been talking about uh, you know we've been talking about generative AI or you know chat GPT etc uh, over the past few months this is one of the the early applications of of uh, generative AI uh, models the main aim of the team that we that we partnered up with was as I said to to have people click on their suggestions, right? That that was their main metric of trying to, uh, you know, of trying to understand whether their search suggestions are actually relevant or not. There, you know, this was the initial goal, and it's part of a broader medium medium to longer term goal, which is to uh, to actually monetize these suggestions, right? So it would be such that if, uh, you know. If you click on these suggestions, uh, then there would be a link embedded, which would take you to the website straight away, rather than taking you to the eventual search page. And if you do actually, if you're able to monetize it, then you actually get revenue from, uh, you know, from the the website that was actually embedded in those suggestions. So, for example, if you know, um, if I'm sitting somewhere and I start you know, typing Carnegie, right? Car for Carnegie Mellon University, I uh, type C-A-R-N-E, there'll be a drop down. maybe there's Carnegie Mellon University, I click on it, then the, then the focal company gets some revenue. And what happens is that the link takes you straight to the CMU website. So, you know, that's the, uh, that's the broader goal of this team. Hence, our outcome of interest would be the click-through rates here, uh, which is you know um, a very standard measure of trying to understand you know uh, a standard measure of success within uh, within such uh, search settings. But we also look at alternative dependent variables. So now let's get to the experimental design. What we have is the following. So think of you know. Um, think of the way that these search suggestions or any sort of recommendations are generated. Think of it as a funnel. Uh, you know, there's millions, uh, you know, there, there are billions of items, which uh, in the initial stages, there's, there's a lot of pruning, you know, reducing dimensionality, uh, um, you know, duplicates, etc. cetera. Our, uh, our experiment is happening at the ranking stage. The ranking stage is when you know you have maybe hundreds of uh, of candidates after removing duplicates, uh, etc., uh, where you have you know where you're finally providing the the top ten as suggestions for the end user. Our control condition will ha had about a million users, um, and in the control. They, the, there was access to the market leaders API, which provided certain candidate data or candidate inputs into the ranking stage. So across both conditions, the ranking algorithm remains the same. This is where you know there are super sophisticated algorithms where you have to merge you know data with with, with personal information, etc. Uh, but keep in mind that queries through the market leaders API are de-identified. So there is no personal information involved. That was the status quo. So when, when we came onto the stage, the experiment was removing access to the market leader's data. Um, and so in this case, what happens is that the entire funnel is simply based on, uh, on the focal company's data. Right, all candidates that are you know after pruning, etc., are, uh, are that serve as an input into the ranking stage uh, are provided within the the same system. 
and there's no access. So keep in mind that the, our treatment is the removal to the access uh, or removal of the access to the market leaders API. I can always come back to this figure, but I want to get, provide a couple of other details. So, you know, what's in it for the market leader uh, to actually share uh, its data? And you know, as we, uh, as I, the the paper that I mentioned early on by by Benzel Hirsch and all, uh, Van Alstein, when the market leaders uh, opens opens up its data ecosystem for each query that's made, it gets you know some uh, some amount of money, right? So the market leader is getting some uh, you know some fee. Uh, while the focal firm is getting, you know, uh, sort of data input into the the critical ranking stage, one of the one of the reasons why the focal firm, you know, really wanted to tap into this uh, was because you know they were worried that they just didn't have enough candidates, right? It's when you're starting up a product. Remember that the product was started in uh, in 2020 in the initial days. They just did, if you don't have enough data, you know, what do you serve up? Uh, uh, what do you serve up potential users of that product? So the focal firm thought that you know there might be quantity and quality, depth and breadth of data, and that's why they entered into this uh, relationship. It a few more details just so that you get a sense of the context, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to dive into the results. This API is available for other companies and individuals within the same market. So it's not as if, you know, th this is some super special arrangement. These are this is a commercial API that's available. As I've mentioned before, queries to the API do not provide uh personal information. Um the ranking algorithm generates a fi final ranking and the top 10 candidates are displayed and they're basically using state of the art uh, you know, uh, machinery here. The the experimental architecture is is you know is in line with the industry standard to the best of our knowledge. Of course, you know, one caveat here is that this is one data sharing uh, context which is out there in the market, right? So, um, and it's happening at the you know. At the stage where there are candidate inputs into the ranking, uh, into uh, the ranking stage, um, we feel that this this captures one dimension of uh, of uh, of what the regulations have talked about. If you know, uh, to to sort of recount, uh, you know, the obligations of the gatekeeper within the DMA setting, ha you know, is potentially making data available on ranking query views click so this is you know again one type within within that broad setting um though we you know even though it's one setting we feel that it's it's important not only from a policy perspective but it's you know this this type of data sharing agreements are out there in the market google you know google with its search suggestions also does something very similar so it's just also good to understand what value they bring uh, to the platform within such a setting. So, you know, with that sort of state set, let me uh, let me go a little bit more into uh, the details of the data and then the results. Um, so, about two and a half million users split equally between treatment and control uh, over uh, over a, uh, over a hundred days. Now. This is a between subject assignment. So when an individual is assigned to the treatment group, that individual stays in that treatment group for the entirety of the experiment. Remember, the treatment group is the removal of access to the market leaders uh, API at the uh, ranking stage. Our unit of analysis will be at the level of the user exactly because that's where the randomization has happened. Um, our main outcome variable of interest is uh, our click-through rates, but you know you can you can substitute it with total number of clicks, probability of click, etc. Uh, you know it, it it's all very very stable. Um, our NDA prohib uh, you know prevents us from disclosing the baseline clicks, so absolute levels. So we're going to be talking about the lift in, in click-through rates. 
uh, you know, it's um, it's basically the incremental CTR amongst the treated users as a percentage of CTR amongst uh, control users. Um, but you know, this is a is a standard way of uh, of measuring uh, of measuring these outcomes. Okay, so I think that's basically it. And now let me let me sort of go into the data. Tiffany, we're good on questions. Just checking. Uh, yeah, right now still no question. But if any audience has any question, just feel free to raise your hand or post the question in the chat. Oh, so Hannah has oh. Hannah actually posed a question. Um, does the firm strictly forward users to external pages or does the firm forward user to the core products website? Oh, right. Um, so to I think I think maybe a, a bit more clarity on the context is the following that since we were partnering up with the team that was focused on the search suggestions um you know the all the data that we have is what was you know in the sort of drop down menu so we don't we aren't actually able to track what happened uh you know or what pages uh you know they they were led to post uh you know after they click Right, so it it can be, uh, you know, it can be a combination. It can be like internal, you know, internal pages, uh, uh, external external links. Uh, as I said, you know, uh, for example, like I was talking, you know, I, I was talking about uh, university links. But if there is, you know, if if there's a query related to COVID, it can be it can be user generated content. It can be, you know, a different health website, a doctor's website. It can be maybe some information that the that the focal company has on its own. So it. As as far as I know, it seems to be it, it seems to be, be a mixture. The the sort of you know uh, this is it was Hannes is, is it yeah uh, so uh, so Hannes let me know if if that's uh, if uh, you know if that's okay but um, you know one of the one of the uh, maybe limitations of you know partnering up with companies is that you know you partner up with the team. And that's you know that's basically the data that you get you know because you have buy-in from that particular team. So we are not able to we are able to sort of see whether they engaged with the with the drop-down suggestions, but not that much more uh, afterwards. Okay. Okay. So uh, now just a few quick randomization checks. Uh, you know, just to make, you know, uh, just so that we're all sure that, uh, you know, the, the randomization took place properly. It's a valid experiment. You know, when, when we look at uh, user characteristics, cross gender, location, operating systems, you know, their activity in the past, uh, query data, et cetera, you know, they're, they're pretty well balanced across uh, control and treatment. On the right hand side panel is the assignment of new users to the treatment relative to the control group over the course of the experiment and that also you know seems pretty balanced so we were happy that you know there, what what we are measuring would uh, would in effect be the impact of the treatment rather than any uh, selection issues okay so um baseline results are the following um Overall, removal to the access of the market leader's API reduces engagement with the product or click-through rates on those search suggestions by about 4.6%, right? So we, you know, I, I like, you know, to get a sense of these point estimates just because you know, it's 4.6% to start off with, it's not 46%, right? It's, uh, it seems to provide some benefit. Um, and so to sort of not be in my sort of subjective bubble, we tried to benchmark these magnitudes, uh, you know, across different settings, uh, you know, within the literature. For example, uh, you know, the paper by Berman and Israeli, they look at 
uh, the provision of data analytics information to online retailers and find that you know uh, revenues increase by four to six percent when you provide that uh, data analytics information. Brynjolfsson, uh, Eric Brynjolfsson, Wang Jin, and and, and Christina McElheron, they find that you know uh, when there's data driven decision making, uh, you know it increases uh, it increases sales and uh, and profits by about three percent. Um, again, throwback to the the same sort of uh, to the to the same seminar series, the average effect that that I find in my paper with Chris Poikert and and your Clausen. Uh, you know, of algorithmic recommendations relative to uh, to human decisions is about three percent. So you know, we're on average we we seem to be in the same sort of ballpark. And I just you know, uh, I feel that these exercises are important so that we get a sense of you know what's in it for platforms and what's in it you know when we think of regulators thinking about how big a benefit it might provide to data sharing agreements it's uh, you know it's in, uh, useful to pin these down okay so that's the baseline effect um then we talk about some heterogeneity uh and what we find is that heavy users in red measured by you know different you know using different measures seem to be affected less uh, seem to be affected more relative to new users so if you you know if you remove access to this third party api data uh, the the decline in click through rates is much larger for heavier users this suggests that you know while it does impact new users data sharing you know through these agreements has you know doesn't have that big of an impact maybe enough to solve uh, the out and out cold start problem I'm going to come back to this result when I talk about the dynamics uh, to understand what what might be happening here. Next, I want to talk about the impact on the different types of content. In particular, uh, I want to you know uh, remind us that queries through the uh, to the API are depersonalized. So depersonalized in the sense that if i'm if i'm typing uh, covid-19 symptoms when there's an api call the api uh, the uh, the external party's uh, uh, api or database doesn't get information on my location on my browser on you know on the type of device that i am using etc um and despite this depersonalization um, what we find is that the click-through rates on uh, popular and niche content declines by similar uh, similar amounts, and um, and you know you, we can dig deeper. So this you know uh, columns one and two are looking at popular and niche, and you can define them in different ways. Um, what we also find is that you know the number of unique categories of the topics. Uh, that are clicked on, um, which we can classify through uh, through our team's um, algorithm, the number of unique categories clicked on also decreases when you remove access to uh, the third party's API. This suggests that you know, as the number of uh, unique categories uh, click through rates declines, this suggests that the gatekeeper's data might be broader. So, despite depersonalization. Because of maybe the breadth of uh, of the gatekeeper's data, uh, you know there might be a benefit for a startup like uh, uh, a startup like company or product to actually leverage access. Okay. Now, the maybe the final yes. Yeah, so I have about five five or six minutes. Um, I'm going to spend that talking about the long term effects, and then I'm going to very quickly wrap uh, wrap up. Given that you know we were fortunate enough to run an experiment uh, or leverage an experiment that ran for almost sixteen weeks, which is you know much longer than the standard one or two week experiment that you find uh, you know when you are when you collaborate with uh, uh, industry partners, we can actually trace out the click through uh, the click through rates or the treatment effects over time, and what we find is the following that the treatment effect initially 
um, you know, became very negative, you know, around eight and a half percent in the first two or three weeks. But over time, it became less negative. All, you know, uh, stabilizing around three and a half percent, you know, between like weeks 11 and 16. So it's sort of uh, pretty stable. So the magnitude of the effect is, you know, half as large uh, in the longer in the longer term relative to the first few weeks. And we feel that just, you know, as an exercise, when we're trying to pin down the value of data or the benefits that uh, that a platform might get or from a policy perspective, uh, you know, it's good to look at, you know, how how things evolve over time, because, you know, if we had stopped our experiment in the first two weeks, the first three weeks, we would have really overestimated the value, uh, the value of this particular type of data in particular. Now, to, to try and understand what might be happening over time here, we posit the role of, you know, algorithmic learning, maybe algorithmic learning is, is, is slightly too strong, but just the development of internal alg algorithmic systems uh, due to internal data. Um, I can go into the details in the discussion more, but there are you know behavioral reasons for why we might be seeing this uh, this upward trend. And one you know one one thought that we had, which we didn't necessarily believe, but it's you know one behavioral explanation could be that look you know uh, if I'm a user who's been using this product for a while, and I see a drop in quality, initially my engagement with the product might decline. But over time, I might just use get used to this not so great quality, right? And so I'm, you know, either either I change the type of prompts I, I provide, or I just, you know, that's that's the quality and that's what I get used to. Now, to rule out that behavioral mechanism and the fact that, you know, this might actually be you know, the internal data systems actually becoming better because they are not dependent on external data anymore, but for, you know, they have the full access to the internal data through the different stages. We look at the heavy users and new users again. The, the idea is the following. Um, if, I'm a, if I'm an old or a heavy user, you know, from prior to the experiment, I know what the product was like before. And hence, uh, you know, if you remove access to this data and the product quality declines, you might see this upward sort of trend. I might get used to it, et cetera. If I'm a new user using the search suggestions for the first time, then I didn't know how it was earlier, right? So then you should, you know, if it was just me getting used to the quality of the product, you shouldn't see this upward trend for new users. If you do, then maybe there is something else going on, which we posit to be uh, this sort of, uh, you know, algorithmic learning behavior. I'm gonna come back to this, but um, what we do find is that, you know, this sort of upward trend or the treatment effect becoming less negative over time, is true for old users as well as new users. And we define new users here as users who log on and use the product for the first time every week, right? So if this is the second week you're using the product, you're not a new user anymore. And we see this upward trend of like, you know, about 6% going, going down to about, you know, 1.5% or 1% negative one. So, we see that you know this sort of negative uh, trend is becoming less negative over time. If this is happening for new users, then maybe there is a fundamental improvement in product quality, and that's where we are talking about uh, you know the the sort of training of the uh, of the internal systems using uh, using the focal platforms data, and we believe that this this sort of makes sense because. Often, you know, these uh, these data sharing agreements. For example, you know, we we uh, we got the usage agreements of you know using Chat GPT open from OpenAI, and 
often these data sharing agreements prevent you from uh, you know prevent you from using the api data as training you know as training data to improve your product for example this you know this uh, this passage that i've highlighted in the in the terms of use says that uh, you know you cannot reverse assemble reverse compile translate uh, to discover the source code or underlying components of models algorithms uh, use output from the services to develop models that compete with open ai right so our our sort of thought process is that you know we had these two competing explanations at least we can rule out one with potential suggestive evidence jacques i'm i'm yeah. just i'm just getting i think i'm almost out of time so i'll wrap up and we can we can chat after okay sure yeah, yeah there's also another question from hana but yeah let's wait after yeah. the QA. yeah okay so finally you know I had talked about, you know, sort of thinking about external validity, the fact that, you know, we don't want, you know, we, we don't want to try and overclaim. Uh, we are looking at one context. There's, you know, there's, uh, there is some external validity to our context. For example, Google had restricted access to its autocomplete API in 2015, and it became quite a big deal. First, we were trying to, you know, use this as a natural experiment, but we just didn't get the data to try and understand, you know, what its implications might be. Uh, we weren't quite sure, you know, uh, what the right context would be uh, here. Um, so just that, you know, it's, it's happening elsewhere too, restricting access. Um, we have, you know, we have a smaller field experiment where we try to make sure that we, we carry out the right manipulation checks. Uh, I'm happy to go into, uh, into it if, you know, uh, if there are questions that come up. Uh, okay. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll conclude with this slide, you know, again, uh, talking, you know, talking to this crowd is always, uh, you know, uh, is always wonderful. I'm looking forward to Hannes's comments and, you know, uh, and other questions. Uh, but you know the the way the way I'm thinking about you know uh, quantifying the value of data, there are these different sources, right? And there are all these papers that are coming out sort of now or in the past couple of years, which are really trying to quantify it. And so you know the way I think about it is three sort of different pillars. You know the focal firms internal data. That's uh, you know that's what I was talking about right at the beginning of the talk. There's you know external public data, which can, you know, create opportunities for new entrants, can lead to uh, more innovation. For <laughs> each of these sort of, uh, for each of these implications for companies or platforms, there's always a policy flip side. Um, and finally, you know, when we, uh, what we focused on uh, in this uh, in this paper is external data or third-party data or data, you know, uh, access to uh, these sharing agreements or APIs. And again, you know, I think that this is a really exciting space uh, with lots of, you know, new papers, uh, new work coming up all the time. So that's all I have. And I'm more than happy to take any questions and listen to what Hannes has, has to say. Sure. So I'm I'm grateful to, to the seminar organizers for inviting me to discuss the paper, and I would really like to compliment the authors, especially Ananya, for, for this really nice piece and excellent presentation. Um, so first, I want to share a few observations of why I love this study. So first, I think the context is highly relevant, as firms increasingly share access to their algorithms and data with APIs um, being really the primary means of doing so. APIs are so like easily adopted, uh, particularly when they result in like performance improvements that you immediately in, in terms of time gains or monetary gains. However, an overlooked fact is that adopting APIs really makes firms dependent on, on providers. And, and this paper really highlights these unintended consequences of, of relying on such external data, inhibiting the development of one's own algorithm. It really has huge implications for data sharing policies, such as those outlined in, outlined, uh, outlined in the DMA. Second, um, I think the presentation and paper provide really nice insights onto how firms actually implement and structure their algorithms using APIs. <laughs> the study can serve as a, as a kind of blueprint for other firms looking to conduct similar experiments and for researchers interested in evaluating the impact. 
of tutorial reviewing the manuscript um, on SSRN, the most recent one uh, published in May, and listening to the presentation, I do have several suggestions that I hope help uh, Ananya and uh, his team to, to further enhance the work. So the first recommendation relates to motivating the outcome metric uh, used in the study. The click-through rate on search results. Uh, the authors demonstrate that removing access to the API decreases the CTI, CTR and alternative metrics, such as the absolute number of clicks. And the authors justify the use of CTR as an important metric due to the potential revenue generation mechanisms on the site. However, considering post-search metrics as an alternative outcome measure could provide valuable insights. For instance, firms often value time spent on a website. Although there may be fewer clicks on those search results, as Ananya has shown, consumers might actually spend more time browsing individual content on the site of the focal firm without really feeling the need to search for new content. Consumers may also care about the quality of the content they find through their search. For instance, it's conceivable that the company's own algorithm is more likely to direct users to existing content of the focal firm, while the API may guide users to categories with you know, maybe limited content to discover on that focal firm. Thus, a higher CTR with the API could imply that consumers need to search longer before finding what they truly desire. To address these concerns, the authors could compare session duration after users have clicked and if such data uh, and if session duration also decreases after the removal of the API, it could provide further evidence for the claim. If this team doesn't have access to such data, which I think they don't after listening to the presentation, exploring insights on null results of the search function could be an option. Like if such null results, like the search function leading users nowhere, for example, because of you know, experiencing high bounce rates are comparable across these experimental conditions, it may alleviate concerns that the API produces better search results, but ultimately fails to guide users to relevant content on the site. As a side remark, and I, I didn't think of this before, but maybe the authors may also want to motivate that search functionality um, tighter in the paper. Like from the presentation, it was clear that the product really was search, Whereas well, while reading the paper, I thought more of a digital platform and then there's this little search functionality. So I think mm. the presentation was a little clearer than what I saw in the paper. And then second, uh, I wanna highlight a concern relating to the firm's own search algorithm, which supposedly underwent drastic improvement during the experiment. So again, after listening to the presentation, I'm not really sure this happened, but that was kind of the feeling I got when reading the paper. I believe it's highly important to explain why the firm actually worked on this algorithm and improved it. In a way, it feels like they have been messing with their own control group. Were they interested in cleanly measuring the effect of the experiment? Did they take a look at the initial results while the experiment was running and then accordingly started tweaking the internal algorithm? If so, what do we really know about these improvements they have been making? My biggest worry here relates to how the answer to all of these questions affects the way we can interpret the long-term effects of the removal of the API. Without a firm making these undocumented changes to their internal algorithm, should we maybe rather expect the short-term effect to apply in the long-term? One way forward is to write more details about these improvements that have been done. So we know about the conditions that other firms may have to create, uh, to expect a similar attenuation effect over time. If no further details on this algorithm can be obtained, then maybe the author how the firm can curb the negative effect over time through improving their own algorithm. But right now I'm really struggling to see whether we should rather expect this effect to be 4.6 with this algorithm improving over time, which may be done by the firm itself, you know, by, by actually intervening, or whether I should rather believe this 8.9 or something, this short-term effect, without uh, expecting the firm to make any improvements. And then I have a few minor suggestions, like the moderation story is really interesting, but only gets very shortly treated in the manuscript. Similarly, the authors could more strongly motivate the additional field experiment at the end of the paper. Um, probably it's value, but it kind of gets lost a little yeah. bit at the end. Um, finally, I would be interested to see the, and hear the author's perspective on comparing external algorithms without personal data, such as this API, to a firm's internal algorithms that do use personal data. With such a data advantage, can we expect firms to beat external algorithms faster? If so, this should have implications on how smaller firms store and use personal data. And it may be worth discussing this at the end of the manuscript. So all in all, let me again compliment uh, Ananya and his team uh, on a very strong manuscript. And I hope you find these comments useful uh, for further improving your work. So all the best with the study and this concludes my discussion.